Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for how you have helped us from the first night until this time. We bless your name, Lord, for revealing your mind to us step by step, bit by bit, in your word. And Lord, we know that your word is not exhausted yet. Our spiritual needs are still there. And we know there is still a lot you want to reveal to our hearts so that we become so transformed until we are conformed to the image of your dear Son, Jesus Christ. And therefore, Lord, we come before you in all sincerity this morning asking that your Spirit will reveal your very mind and your demands to every one of us in Jesus' name. We pray, O Lord, that our hearts will not despise your word. Neither will our flesh reject the truth in your word in Jesus' name. We pray, O Lord, that as we come before you now, that everything within us will be turned upwards towards you so that we'll see, we'll know, we'll understand, we'll believe and embrace everything you have in your word for everyone in Jesus' name. We're praying, O oh Lord, that we will not be like those people at the time of Ezekiel that will gather as the people gather, listen as the people listen, and yet they have their idols in their hearts, and they will not give up, and they will not do what the word is saying. And it will appear that the message to them might be beautifully presented, but then they will not do. Father, we pray you give us hearts that obey hearts that will comply with every word in jesus name that lord after this retreat we ourselves will know that something definite has happened in our own lives and we pray that the spiritual oppression you perform during this time in our hearts will not be of temporary effect it will be permanent in our hearts and our lives and families in jesus name as we come before you right now we say speak lord for your servants are hearing in jesus name we pray 
in Micah chapter 6, we're reading from verse 6 through to verse 8. Micah chapter 6, from verse 6. Wherewith shall I come before the Lord, and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has showed thee, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. This morning we come to an important subject of scripture. A scripture that touches the very heart of God, and a scripture and a subject that was so demonstrated and revealed by the Lord Jesus Christ in his own life. Not only that, it's a subject that Jesus Christ spoke about, and he put a lot of emphasis on the subject to his own disciples. And his own disciples, when he began their apostolic ministry, eventually, although it took them a long time to learn the lesson, eventually they learned the lesson. And we find in the Acts of the Apostles references to this important subject, not only that, in virtually all the epistles, we find exhortation, commandments, and promises, illustrations, as well as instruction and the life that the apostles live, referring to the subject we are talking about. It is something that as you go from the beginning of the Bible and you go through the Old and the New Testaments, you'll find that the Lord puts a high value, worth, and price on the subject. And it is something that shows today whether a person is actually following the Lord or is not following the Lord. The children of Israel came to a situation in their lives when all that remained for them was the outward form of religion and then what the lord wanted of them they were not actually carrying out and as we look at churches and denominations and we consider them one by one the same thing you will find out that by and large denominations concentrate on the outward things outward forms of worship and it forget and neglect the great thing of the word of god as you look at individual Christians, this is what you also discover, that these individual Christians may then eventually put some high value, high worth and high price upon some things that you can see. It may be upon their title, it may be upon their responsibility, it may be upon their position, it may be upon some past sacrifice that they add, which is no more relevant in their lives today. And so the children of Israel came and they were asking the prophet. And they seemed to be telling the prophet, we hear your preaching. We hear your prophecy. We hear what you are saying. Bring him from the Lord. We hear the challenges and we hear all the things you are telling us to do. Now tell us point blank. Are you telling us to come before the Lord? and bow so that our heads will touch the ground where we shall i come before the lord and bow myself before the high god micah is that what you prophets are telling us or shall i come with bond offerings and with the cows of a year old we remember the time of the passover when the lord commanded the children of israel that they will take a lamb a young lamb and then they will separate him on the 10th day and bring it on the 14th day 
Are you telling us that what God is requiring from us is to go into the flock and take out an animal and offer that to the Lord? Or will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams? A kid is not enough. A lamb is not enough. Burnt offering is not enough. You see, asking us, like at the time of Solomon, when he dedicated the temple, and he brought thousands of rams before the Lord, or oh, is not satisfied with just the rams, does he want ten thousands of rivers of oil? We well, remember the time of those priests that he'll just pour the blood and pour the oil before him. Is he telling us to just go and get barrels of oil and pour before him and spend a lot of money bringing that oil before the Lord? Oh, that's not enough for God. We well, remember now Abraham, we just heard about him this morning. And uh, Abraham, you said, bring your only son that you love. Is that what God is telling us to do now? That you go and bring your child, you go and bring your daughter, you go and bring your son? Will the Lord be satisfied with my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? And Micah said, Why do you evade the issue? Why do you push aside the real thing? Why are you asking these questions as if you do not know that God is not just looking at those outward things, He's requiring something from within you? He has shown thee, O oh man. Although you give excuses, although you try to ask all these questions, how do we come before the Lord? Although you are talking about bowing down till your forehead will touch the ground, although you are talking about burnt offering, although you are talking about rivers of oil, although you are talking about uh, bringing even your child to offer to the Lord, you know the truth. You know what he requires. He has showed the old man what is good. You know it. And what does the Lord require of thee? This is what he wants. For you to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. That's all that the Lord is requiring from you. That you will do justly. That your life will show the justice, the righteousness, the equity, the impartiality of God. Not only that, that you will love mercy. Not just that you love mercy to get mercy from other people, but you love to do the deeds of mercy. Forgiving other people. Loving other people. Overlooking the offenses contrary to you. Love mercy. Have a tender heart. Have a changed life. Have a heart that is not the heart of stone like we had this morning, but a heart of flesh. And love mercy, a life of compassion, a life of love, a life of tenderness, a life of kindness unto other people. But that's not enough to then walk humbly with thy God because he resists the proud. And that is what the Lord is telling us this morning that is requiring that we will walk humbly before him. Humble walk of Christ's followers. How can anybody follow Christ and not be humble? How can a true follower of Christ ever be proud? How is it ever possible that a person will see the very Son of God, Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who lowered himself to the point of coming to this world and forsook everything. And then he said, I am meek and lowly. How can we see this meek and humble and lowly Jesus and say we are following him and not have that same humility? The humble walk of Christ's disciples, Christ's followers. In Philippians chapter 2, reading from verse 3. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem other better than themselves. 
Here is the word of God. This is the New Testament. Now the new covenant telling us that those who partake in that new covenant, those who partake in the cleansing of the blood of Jesus, and those who partake in the transformation that Calvary and the cross will bring into our lives, and those who become new creatures in Christ and are now in the kingdom because they are translated from the kingdom of darkness unto the kingdom of his dear son. And those who profess to be the disciples of Jesus Christ, here is the mark, here is the demand, let nothing, nothing at home, nothing in church, nothing in the office, nothing on the street, nothing in the village, nothing with your friend, nothing with your subordinates, and nothing with your superior. Let nothing be done through strife, disagreement, argument, fighting, quarreling, and opposition, and criticism, and conflict, and tearing things apart, and violence. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, haughtiness, or pride. Let nothing be done through vainglory, but in lowliness of mind. You see, the lowliness and the humility will start from the earth. In lowliness of mind, let each esteem all the better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things. Look not every man on his own desires, on his own wants, on his own likes, on his own privilege, on his own position, on his own possession, on his own desires. Look not every man on what I want this that belongs to me that should have been given to me look not every man on his own things but every man also on the things of others and let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God but he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He became, unto, he became obedient unto inconvenience, more than that, he became obedient in difficulty, more than that. He became obedient in criticism, more than that. He became obedient in suffering, more than that. He became obedient unto death. The obedience that the Bible talks about, the obedience that the Bible is telling the disciples, the followers of Jesus Christ, to demonstrate and to show and reveal, manifest in their lives, it's not when it's convenient for me. When I like the commandment, when it is uh, presented to me in a wonderful way, you see what I don't like is the way I, I like the truth, I like the preaching, I like the doctrine. What I don't like is the way they presented it to me. You see, you don't understand the Bible then. You don't understand the word of God then. It appears that after, as you look at the Bible, you look at the Old Testament in particular. Those prophets of the Old Testament, they, it appears they never learned what we call uh, communication. In the sense of making it palatable. Making it look nice. Making it look well structured. And you just come across Elijah. He confronted Ahab. And when he confronted Ahab, he, he didn't have introduction and point one, point two, point three, and then encouragement, and then the final conclusion, and say, Ahab, what do you think about it now? No, direct, forthright. And when you think about Samuel coming to Saul and telling Saul what he has done, he wasn't, uh, you know, having it uh, gradually built up and uh, telling him, well, I just want to tell you that uh, although you have disobeyed the Lord, but you know God is a merciful God and uh, don't uh, be so sorrowful like that, but the Lord will have mercy upon you. You have sinned. He has rejected you from being a king. 
because your way is not right in the sight of the Lord, because your disobedience is like witchcraft. You know, it wasn't a kind of uh, presenting it to him in this way and this way. And Moses came and he saw the children of Israel and they had made themselves naked. Not only that they had made themselves naked, they had raised up an idol and they were dancing around that idol. And here was David, here was Moses coming from the mountain top of God with the two uh, tables of stone in his hand. And then he said, what has happened to these people? And then when he saw them, he broke the two tables of stone. And then he ground that thing into powder. And when he ground it to powder, he put it in water and said they should drink it as discipline to them. And then he went to the camp. And then he didn't have a long introduction and all these wonderful points. He presented, he said, who is on the Lord's side among you? Let him come unto me here. And that's the way he gave the altar call. They didn't close their eyes. Uh, nobody will see you. Just everybody close your eyes now and raise up your hand if you will be on the Lord's side. The Lord will bless you and this will happen and that will happen. No, it was not like that. You see, some people, they say, I, I like the Bible. The only thing I don't like is how those deep and light preachers preach it. I like uh, the word of God. All those sound doctrines, in fact, if I have reasonable preachers, if I have preachers that will present it to me in a way that I will understand, I will take it. Well, you have to take it the way God has presented it. And here it says, according to the word of God, that Jesus Christ, he was obedient unto death. Not only when it is convenient, when it is not convenient. Not only when it is simple, but when it is difficult. Not only when you like it, even when your flesh will not like it. That if you are going to follow Jesus Christ, you will follow the Lord. And you will be obedient to the word of God, even if it requires death. And it may not require physical death, it will require the death of your nature. We had it about, we had about it this morning, except that a corn of wheat will fall into the ground and die. It abideth alone. And except that death happens in your life, you will not be able to do the will of God. But it is when you say, speak Lord, even if that word will destroy something within even if that word will kill and destroy the carnality within. Even if that word will lead me to the point where I so surrender, I so give myself, and everything is dead, I am going to accept the word of God. Is that what you are going to do this morning? I said, is that what you are going to do this morning? You will accept the word of God even if it cuts you. And uh, we're going to read the word of God and it may cut you this way and cut you this way and cut you on the other side. It may touch every part of you. You see, the word of God touches every part of man. Uh, I, I wonder for the people that preach the word of God. And the word of God does not touch any real part in the lives of the people. And I'm telling you, the word of God is going to touch even some things that may look dear to you. That may look important to you. That may look indispensable to you. But your attitude should be that if you are going to follow Jesus Christ, how can you follow Jesus Christ without bearing your cross? How can you follow Jesus Christ without denying self? How can you follow Jesus Christ without dying to self? How can you follow Jesus Christ without forsaking all things? How can you follow Christ without being humble? How can you follow Christ without being separated from the world? How can you follow Christ without following Christ to the point to say, I know that is Christ calling me. I know that is Christ going that way. Whatever it demands and whatever it is a consequence in my life, I'm going to follow him even to through to the point of death if that is a required thing. And I believe that the Lord will give us the grace. I say the Lord will give us the grace. And we will follow the Lord in Jesus' name. We're combining two messages together. That is the humble walk of Christ's followers and the leaven of worldliness. And we have three points to consider. Number one, the danger of pride and leaven of worldliness. There are two things there. Number one is pride. Number two is the leaven of worldliness. And they are connected together. I want to show you, according to the word of God, the danger, the danger, the danger of pride and the leaven of worldliness. Number two, true humility in God's sight. True humility in God's sight. 
Number three, repentance, separation, and transformation of the true followers. Repentance, separation, and transformation of the true followers. Let's look at number one, the danger of pride and the leaven of worldliness. In Proverbs chapter 6, Proverbs chapter 6, reading from verse 16, these six things does the Lord hate, yea, seven are abomination unto him. These things that we're going to read about, the Lord hates them. He hates them. And we're told that he says, I am God, I change not. What he hated at that time, he still hates today. He hates it in an apostle if it's there. He hates it in a prophet if a prophet has it. He hates it in an evangelist. He hates it in a pastor. He hates it in a teacher. He hates it in a minister. He hates it in members of the church. He even hates it when he sees it in the sinners that have not come to Christ. Anywhere, anytime, in anyone, he sees any of these things, he hates them. And he says, seven, abomination unto him. There are many people that feel that it's only when a woman wears slacks when he wears something like a, a pair of trousers, they say that is abomination. That is abomination, but that's not the only abomination. If you have any of these things also, it is abomination in the sight of God. Verse 17, a proud look. A proud look. A proud look. Did you ever find any of our overseer to uh, discipline anyone because uh, that person has a proud look? And then the overseer will call the uh, sister in the choir and say, Sister, please, uh, you can't sing uh, for some time because of the abomination in your life. And then the overseer will uh, say, This abomination is a terrible thing. And then the sister will say, um, Excuse me, sir, what's the abomination? Because I don't wear slacks. Because uh, when I come to church, I cover my head. Because I cover my nakedness. What's the abomination you are talking about? And the overseer will say, because uh, your outlook, your appearance, your comportment is proud, it's haughty. The air around you, the atmosphere around you, the way you look, the way you carry yourself, the way you look down on other people, you have a proud look. And... Um, the sister might say, is that all? And the overseer says, that's all. You know, she will go to all the other members of the choir. <laughs> I, I had another new doctrine today. They have disciplined me. What did you do? You committed fornication? You committed adultery? Or what's the matter? <laughs> if I tell you, you'll be surprised. Pastor brought another one today what did he say <laughs> if i tell you he said i have a proud look did you ever hear that before are you serious is that all he said you didn't steal church money you didn't commit adultery you didn't commit fornication all is that he said you have a proud look all of our tribe in this church we're going to have a meeting and then they have the meeting they say we must challenge this one they have been disciplining people this one will fight it out and then they come to pastor in their organized committee uh, pastor big overseer we hear that new doctrine has now come that we don't discipline people again for just uh, adultery, for just fornication, for just stealing now. Uh, now we hear that our sister, the best in the choir, the only one that we are representing our tribe in the choir, has been disciplined on the basis of, well, we will not say, say it yourself, pastor. And then the pastor will say, 
I never saw anything like this in our church that a group of people will come and challenge the pastor of the church because one person was disciplined in the choir. What's the matter? No, we're going to settle this one. Not like in the past. That say stand up, we stand up, sit down, we sit down. This one, we will settle it. And then the pastor, knowing that uh, the cloud and the dust is so much and is afraid that they are going to break the church, he said, well, I'm trying to follow the Bible. That if something is abomination in the sight of God, then abomination cannot be in the choir. Abomination should not be in the house fellowship. Abomination should not be among the ushers. Abomination should not be among the workers. They say, show it to us, show it to us. They have never read their Bibles. But they say they are saved. They say they are sanctified. They say they are baptized in the Holy Ghost. They even say that uh, we deeper life, we are too slow. We should have already made them bishop, but we still make them house fellowship leaders. And then we read it to them, and it says, a proud look. And they said, we we'll see it now. But uh, is that not a problem of everybody? Are we going to crucify our sister just because of the proud look? Eh, Pastor, have mercy now. Have mercy on abomination. Have mercy on sin. After all, you are a father to everybody. And as they told us uh, yesterday, if your child uh, passes excreta on you, no problem. Remain in the workers. And if your child urinates on you, after all, no problem. Even if God rejects that person and it becomes abomination in sight of God, leave her alone now. The Bible does not say so. A proud look. And then it says a lying tongue. And hands that shed innocent blood. The people that commit abortion, shedding innocent blood. You know what the Bible says? It says these things are abomination in the sight of God. And you want to sit up. You want to examine your Christian life. And you want to see whether you really are following the Bible or not. So it says a proud look and a lying tongue. And then hands that shed innocent blood. And it says hearts that devises wicked imagination. Feet that be swift in running to mischief. A false witness that speaketh lies. And he that soweth discord among the brethren. And so you have seen there that according to the word of God, pride is very dangerous because it brings abomination into your own life. You see, when we talk about pride, why do people get proud at all? There is no reason for pride, but there are excuses for pride. Some people are proud because of their natural attributes natural attributes because of some qualities they think they have because of some beauty they think they have because of some intelligence they think they have they are proud other people are proud because of their material possession because of things they have been able to gather up more sand than other people more cement than other people more iron than other people what i call sand and all that is the houses they are built and what I call the glass and the iron is because of the wretched vehicle that is carrying them about that can give up any time. And because of those things, they have pride. Other people because of physical beauty. Other people because of their social attainment. Other people because of their temporary achievement. An achievement that is there today that you may not find there tomorrow. Because of that, some people are proud. Other people, because of canal comparison. That you, you heard that this morning, the canal comparison. They prefer that preacher to that preacher. That singer to this singer. That worker to this worker. That profession to this one. And then they see, look at me. I'm better than the other person because of canal comparison. Other people because of religious affiliation. That's why they are proud. And I know a lot of people in deeper life that are proud because they are in deeper life. Listen. Those people, they don't contribute anything positive to deeper life, but they are the first people to say, you know my church, I belong to deeper life. But wait a minute. If everybody behaved like this person that is talking, what will deeper life look like? If everybody was disobedient, rebellious, 
incorrigible as this person that is so proud i belong to deeper life you belong to deeper life what are you contributing to deeper life are you contributing your witnessing to deeper life your pure life to deeper life your pure language to deeper life your sacrifice to deeper life your commitment to deeper life and your consecration to deeper life they are not contributing anything for the progress of the church and they are the first to exhibit pride that they belong to deeper life because of religious affiliation they are proud other people because of their worldly association because they belong to this club and that club and that club because of that they are proud other people because of family attachment they would say don't you know my family i come from a royal family please remember all i've seen and come short of the glory of god even the father the grandfather the great grandfather of that royal family the, the sentence of the word of god is that all have seen and come short of the glory of god therefore we need to understand that pride is something that is uh, abominable in the sight of god and if you are proud if there is pride in any area of your life the Lord is very stern, is very fierce eh, concerning that because he will not have it. He will not have it in an apostle. He will not have it in a minister. He will not have it in a member of the church. He will not have it in a man. He will not have it in a woman. And there are many ways in which people demonstrate pride. I've read it to you already, number one. People demonstrate pride in their look. You can see the way they look. You can see the, their comportment. You can see the air around them. You can see their behavior, interaction to other people. And you will see pride there. Not only that, there are people that are proud in speech. Proud in speech. You remember Lucifer, the morning star. You remember that he that became Satan, the devil. He was proud in his speech. If we have time, I'll read it to you. You remember Nebuchadnezzar, he was proud in his speech. You remember Herod in Acts chapter 12, he was proud in his speech. And there are some people like that when they are talking to people. And uh, they are going to university, does not come into the conversation. They are getting the certificate, does not come into the conversation. They will uh, turn the conversation around uh, when I was at the university. Oh, you've gone to university before? Oh, yes. But there's a mistake in every sentence, grammatical mistake every sentence you make. But you've gone to university before? Oh, yes. But you don't pronounce uh, your words correctly, sir. And with all that university degree, he wants us to know he has gone to university. And you, when he writes a letter to you, there is spelling mistake in every sentence. And yet, he wants everybody to know, I've gone here, I've gone there. And then the other fellow, for, for, him, for him to make us know that he has traveled before. If uh, you, know, you are talking about ordinary things, you are talking about the price of Gary and the price of beans and the price of uh, milk. He will say, uh, some years ago when I was in uh, Germany. <laughs> You've been in Germany before? And you don't know how to tie a tie. You've been in Germany before? Pride. They just try to bring something into the conversation that will show where they have been, that will show what they have got because there is pride in their speech. And then uh, some people are proud in their walking. If we have time, I believe, you'll see these things in the word of God. The way they walk. They, they try to learn. And they look at themselves. They look down on other people. And they will, they will act as if they are the only one. They are the owner of everything. Never mind. They may not have a job. Never mind. They have not eaten since morning. But they will act as if they are the owner of, of all the things we have around. Other people are proud in their appearance. Isn't that why some people say, well, I, I, can't, I can't join that deeper life. I hear them, I've been to their retreat. I have seen that they preach salvation. In fact, I've never seen a church preaching the word of God like that before. I went to their retreat and they almost read the whole Bible to me. All the messages, they quote from Genesis, from Exodus, from Revelation, from Matthew, from Romans, everywhere. In fact, my five days 
in their retreat in December, I learned more Bible than I've ever learned in my church for the past 10 years. But, although they know the Bible, I cannot be in that church. You know why? Because, look at my appearance now. Don't I look nice? You look awful. But then she will say, don't I look nice? If I join that church, they will say that all these things I will change. Eh? Me. Of all people, you'll tell the story in hell. You see, because of the proud appearance, they cannot and they will not want to stay in a place where the truth of the word of God is being preached. Other people are pride in their attitude. You can see it in their attitude. Uh, the overseer calls them and the overseer is talking to them the way they will look. It will appear, in fact, the, if the overseer is a very vigilant, sensitive person, he will not want to finish his conversation. He will say, uh, maybe I'll see you another time. Maybe uh, you are not actually ready for what I want to say now. Maybe uh, when you think you're ready, you want to listen, you'll come back. Because the attitude is so full of pride, arrogance. Other people are proud in their behavior. Other people have their proud plans. Other people, their decisions are taken in pride. Other people, what they purchase in the market is a symbol of their pride. They go to the market and, uh, you know, the rest of us just go in there, we sit down there, we buy the shoe, we buy the clothes. 30 minutes, you're out. The lady is still, uh, you know, there two hours, three hours, only to buy a single dress. He will take one, lift it up like this, put it on her shoulder. He will say, Madam, you don't have any mirror here where I can look at myself. Uh, there's a mirror here. Get behind the curtain and look at herself. And what, Madam, come in. How do I look like this? Well, it befits you. The woman wants to sell. The woman will not tell you her mind that the way you look, you look like a frog. Blown up, swollen. The woman will not tell you that because if the woman told you the truth, you'll not buy. Will say that, well, you look very nice. And then you put it down. Bring me that other one. How many are you going to buy? She is going to buy only one. In fact, her money cannot buy that one complete. But she must try 10 and 15. Christian. That's what they say. They say they are Christians. They say that they belong to Jesus Christ. And they waste all that time. They are proud in their purchases. Not only that in their decorations. They decorate this. They decorate that. They decorate that. They decorate almost everything. They are proud in boasting. They are proud in oppressing other people. They are proud in their friendship. And they say, well, I am not the colleague of so-and-so. I'm not the match of so-and-so. I'm not an equal to so-and-so. Uh, they are trying to befriend me, but that is not my taste. And that is not my equal. And you cannot befriend me. They, they are so selective in who they will even talk to in the church of God. Also in their segregation and separation. You see them to be proud. You see also that in their expectation, very, very proud. You say, uh, brother, uh, why have you not got married? Well, I'm still searching. And in fact, uh, some of those sisters, uh, they have, some of them have approached me. They said that the overseer gave them chance to come and see me. That they saw the will of God to me. And I told them they didn't know what they were talking about. And I asked her, I said, what's your name? And I said, when were you born again? And I said, which uh, college did you go? And I said, that from what family are you? And I said, uh, how many chapters of the Bible do you read every day? How many hours do you pray every day? And she says she only read two chapters of the Bible a day. Me, I cannot marry a person like that. Because you know how high and how great I am. How exalted I am. If people know that I marry somebody like that, what will they think about me? Eh? And they say they are children of God. In their expectation, in their planning, there is pride. 
or it is that it's a sister that uh, you know a brother uh, would have seen the marriage committee and our leader in the region and then eventually they go to her and uh, sister can i speak to you she will look like this and look at him from the head to the shoe to everything without saying a word and after that just turn back no time now what's that where are you coming from have you visited calvary do you know the lord and eventually the brother will be running after her sister you have not heard what i wanted to say listen to me now then she will turn back like jezebel okay what do you want to say by the way i have no time keep it short and if you are going to talk about marriage before you talk before you open your mouth let me tell you point blank i have 100 qualifications that I've written down how tall, how educated, where you are working, what kind of car you have, what kind of clothes you have, how your senior sister behaves, what your mother looks like, and when you came to church, what you are doing in the church. I tell you, as you see me, I will not marry house leader. If you are house leader, don't even talk. All the qualifications I have, I put everything down. Before you talk, if that is what you are coming for, let me tell you. And then after she has said everything, the brother says, My sister, these qualifications, because I've been long in deeper life, you will not get anybody except an angel. And when that angel comes, he is going to give you his own qualification and disqualify. You will not get man, you will not get angel. You'll stay like that. Pride. They cannot submit themselves to the will of God. They cannot say, Lord, educated or not educated, coming from this or coming from that, oh Lord, thy will be done. That's Christianity. But the kind of Christianity we find today, that in all the expectations, in all their plans, there is so much pride. It is not the will of God. And I pray that this very day, everything will be crushed away from our lives in Jesus' name. We have to change. And we will change. I said we will change. Our dressing will change. Our lifestyle will change. Our marriage expectation and marital life will change everything within us. And that's why the rapture has not taken place. As I came, uh, as I watched you this morning, and uh, when our brother was leading the prayer after the message on absolute surrender and entire sanctification, and he said, don't let us deceive ourselves, let us be sincere, and let us uh, raise up our hands if we really know that we want to pray seriously. And I saw the hands that went up. I asked myself the question, Oh Lord, what if the rapture had taken place yesterday? What would have happened to us? Because the Bible says, He that has this hope in him purifies himself, even as Christ is pure. The Bible says that, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. And he gave himself for it, that he may sanctify, wash it with the cleansing of water by the word, and present to him, unto himself a glorious church. Not having spot, not having wrinkle, not having any blemish or any such thing, but be holy unto the Lord. Be ye therefore perfect, for your, because your Father in heaven is perfect. What if the rapture had taken place last week before we came? We, would have, we pastors would have thought we were preaching, we were helping you. And we were already we were serving the Lord and consecrating and sacrificing, only to get up there. If we get there, we pastors ourselves. Only to get there and say, where are my members? And then two people showed up out of 2,000. And then we say, what did I spend my life for? Because without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Whatever gift we manifest, without holiness, how are you going to see the Lord? But thank God you came. I, I pray that the prayer you prayed this morning will have a permanent effect upon your life in Jesus' name. Uh, because what good will it do us? Here we preach, almost preach our intestines out. 
Here we preach almost going through the whole Bible. Here we preach sweating and almost dying on the pulpit. And then after we have done all that, then we don't find people that are so associated with Christ. We don't find people that are so obedient to the word of God that eventually when the trumpet shall sound and the dead in Christ shall be raised and we which are alive shall be caught up together with them only to find out that although many have been called into the deeper life assemblies but few, just about ten or about hundred or just a few people are eventually up there. And then we ask ourselves, where are the Christians from those, uh, from those days? Where are the people, the hundreds of the thousands of people that were wrote down their members? And then the Lord says, they can't be here. Heaven can't change the standard for anyone. Heaven will have to keep to that standard. And it will have to remind us at the time of Noah. Because it said, as it was in the day of Noah, so shall it be at the time of the coming of the Son of Man. While they were drinking and eating, marrying, giving in marriage, then that day came upon them unawares. So they have to remind us that of the hundreds of thousands of people, at that time, only eight people were able to get into the ark. And my question to you today, today is how many of us that are even here we are workers and how many of our members will be able to reach that place if only eight out of the world at that time they were able to make it eventually and that's why we came so that everything that is not right in our lives by the grace of God the hammer of the word the sword of the word will knock and cut everything away from our lives in Jesus name if you allow the Lord to walk in your life, you will be a person that will be happy for eternity. But if you say, no, I'm not going to give up. No, I'm set in my ways. No, I know who I am. No, what I'm doing, I will continue to do. Well, we will miss you there. We will not see you there. You'll be then with Satan and his angels. And with all those religious people outside. And then when you eventually get to the other side, to the opposite side. The people are going to be asking you because they will know you. They will know you. They know you in your region. They know you in your cities. They will say, Madam, you came here too. I thought you said that we, we were sinners. I thought you said we were not born again. But I thought you were born again. You are going with them. How many times did you travel to Lagos? How many times did you come to pray to me? Eh? So you are hypocrite. And you will not be able to talk. They will say, they will call you then sister. They will say, sister, you are here. Then they will see the man. Ah, are you not brother? I thought that uh, apart from going to retreat, you used to go to Lagos. Every time I see you, you will talk as if you are the son of uh, that uh, Pastor Kumui. And you will say, I've gone to Lagos. I went for counseling. I went, eh? You are here too? Ah. Why? Kumui didn't take you to the other side? I thought that uh, we, we used to hear him on the radio. He will preach and preach. And we said, oh, those, uh, those people under that man's teaching, they are lucky. You are not lucky. They will ask you a question. And that's why we came this day. So that that bad story will not happen to you, will not happen to any of us. Oh, how I pray. If I could, if I could take you with me, if I can snatch you away from the devil, if I can just hold you like this, and say, no, you will not backslide. No, you will not go. No, you will not follow the devil. If I, if you will allow me to do it. By the grace of God, by the preaching of the word of God, by prayer, by the power of the Holy Ghost. If you can allow me just to hold your hand like this and tell you it is almost time. And tell you that we are about to hear the sound of the trumpet and beg you and plead with you and say, don't go to the world, don't go to the devil, don't go into that scene of pride. Let us believe the Lord and let us stand together. And that is what I want you to do. I love you so much. I don't even want to go to heaven without you. 
I love you so much. I don't want you to leave you. I don't want to leave you in the world. And that is why I'm pleading with Jesus Christ every day saying, Oh Lord, don't allow them to perish. And that is why I read all the Bible to you. I read all the word of God to you saying, Come out of the world. Come out of the world. Do not touch the unclean thing. And let us join together. Let us bind together. Let's rise up to pray. Let's rise up to pray. Talk to the Lord. That pride will not ruin you. Talk to the Lord. Talk to the Lord. That worldliness will not ruin you. Talk to the Lord that you give yourself, you give your heart, you give your mind, you give your soul, you give everything that you have. You give yourself unto the Lord. Don't you want to go to heaven? 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 Proud people will not be there. Haughty people will not be there. Adulterers will not be there. Fornicators will not be there. Rebellious people will not be there. Incorrigible people will not be there. Disobedient people will not be there. Worldly people will not be there. Jezebels will not be there. Why don't you call upon the Lord and say, Lord, 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 have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Why do you want to backslide? Why do you want to backslide? Why do you want to go back into the things you rejected many years ago? Why do you want to go back to your vomit? Why do you want to go into the jewelry, into the painting, into the palming once again? Why? 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 Don't you love the assembly of the children of God? Don't you love the assembly of the people that are calling upon the Lord? Don't you love this pilgrimage wanting to go to heaven? Don't you love the Lord? Don't you want to serve the Lord with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength? Why will you allow the things of the world to draw you back and to drive you back? Why don't you call upon the Lord? Why don't you call upon the Lord and say, Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, I'm sorry. For the evils in my life. For the pride in my life. For the hypocrisy in my life. For the worldliness that has come back into my life. For the talkativeness, for the gossiping, for the anger, for the evil that has come back into my life. Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, I'm sorry. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Let him cleanse you. Let him cleanse you. Let him cleanse you. Let him wash you. Let him purge you. Let him purify your life. And let everything change. Everything change. Everything change in your life. Pride is abomination in the sight of God. Pride is abomination in the sight of God. Come ye out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord. Separate yourself from the world, from the customs of the world, from the dressing of the world, from the language of the world, from the drinking of the world, from the smoking of the world, from the business of the world, from the, from the tradition of the world. Come ye out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, touch not the unclean thing, 
touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you. And I will receive you. And I will receive you. And ye shall be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Ye shall be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Get ready for heaven, the time is short. 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 Let your heart be clean. Let your life be humble in the hand of God. Let a righteous man smite me. It will be ointment upon my head. Can you stand rebuke? Can you stand correction? Or are you so proud you will not stand correction? Are you so proud you will not allow correction in your life? Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy, call upon the name of the Lord and he will receive you.